evening. Do come and have a sit down. I'm out of breath already. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Richard Burns, board explorer. Uh, just need a glass of water to start the show. Thank you so much for coming. Did you find it right? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching all the videos and doing all the usual stuff. Martin and I. Hang on. Listen. Mark, wait a minute. I told him to be here. <laughs> I said, I said, come here. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for... Because obviously everybody immediately recognises you as soon as you make an appearance because you have... Wait a minute. Normally, you have a distinct... There's something about... Hang on, I can't quite get this. There's something very, very distinct about Martin Snow. You can't be Martin Snow. You've got to be an imposter. Take your coat off, Martin. Is that right? <laughs> Are you Martin Snow? I am indeed. Thank you. What do you think about the turnout? Today? It's wonderful. Isn't Good to nice? see you all. See all those lovely faces coming yeah. here? And we haven't got the protection of the camera. No. And the screen, they could come up at any minute with their rotten tomatoes and throw them at oh, us. Oh dear. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Oh well, never mind. <laughs> Thank you. Now, Martin, you're going to go over there and have a rest for a moment. Yes, I, I need Martin, it after you that. Working very, very hard. All that terrible activity, as I'm sure you can imagine. His brain is coming up with the next idea for the next show. So what we thought we would do, Martin and I are going to tell you a little bit about ourselves because you see us on the, hopefully, you see us, well, it's the only place we've advertised it, you see us on Facebook and YouTube. Who watches us on Facebook? Put your hands in there. Who watches us on YouTube? Oh, it's evenly spread. Oh, that's interesting. Thank you very much for that. So, you see us uh, uh, walking about, getting all our facts mixed up and muddled up and wrong and, and all the rest of it, and you comment and you tell us how awful we are. No, no, not at all. So, I thought it'd be good if we told you a little bit about ourselves, the stuff that you don't know, and hopefully, when you see all the bumbling idiots on the screen, you'll understand a little bit more about our background. So, uh, I don't want to bore you too much, but uh, I'll do my best. So, first of all, me, Richard Bowes, I went to uh, a school in Horsham, Aronside Primary School. Anybody? No, anyone from Horsham? No. Not a school. Oh, there we are. Aronside. Is it still there? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's lovely. I was there as a little kiddie and I used to do puppet shows. Got into puppet shows. Still sort of doing that sort of stuff many years ago. Then I progressed to high echelons of education, ladies and gentlemen. Forest Boys which was a bit of a rough, comprehensive, 1970s comprehensive school. You can imagine that. I was actually bullied quite a lot. can't imagine why. One of the things that the body boys used to do to me was uh, use me as a battering ram. I think that's why my hair fell out, actually, because they would use me against brick walls. I can tell you that the school is still standing, and I, I am still standing too. I went on from there to... I um, was interested in drama, and that sort of thing. The school drama isn't very good, uh, especially in a boys' school, because there's no girls. And the parts that I were offered were always the girly bits, and wearing a dress. And, you know, when you're sort of 13, 14, um, I mean, it's not like uh, 
the society that we live in today, where it's you know, gender fluid and all of this, it was very much, you know, oh, I'm not going to be a girl, I'm not going to be a girl, well, I'll be a girl. I didn't like it, but I joined something, an outfit called Horsham Young Players. They were um, a youth theatre, they're associated with another theatre called Theatre 48, who I think are still going. I'm not quite sure they bung stuff on at the, the capital. Got interested in, um, obviously, in drama and acting, so I went to summer schools at Lodge Hill. Have you heard of Lodge Hill? Yeah. 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 Lovely. Is it still, is it still yeah. run yeah. by the West Sussex County <coughs> Council? Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. 52 acres of woodland, apparently. Um, so I'm told, the drama advisor who used to run that would always say, oh, welcome to Lodge Hill, 52 acres of woodland here for you to enjoy. Not that we ever did, because we were too busy doing our drama and all that sort of stuff. But I met a bloke called Nigel Cooper there. Um, he's not here tonight, unfortunately, because he's working. Um, but his name will come up a few times in my career. A lovely bloke. He now does feet. So if anyone needs their feet looking after, nails clipping and filing, He's the bloke to see. He's a very nice chap, very good friend of mine. We used to have um, silly um, phrases when we were at, uh, at, uh, on the drama school. I don't know why, I must have started to get a bit quirky back then, because I would say things like, um, I was just, I don't know why, I was always reciting things like, I won't have any daughter in my house with an artificial leg. <laughs> which was, a bit, I think it came from some scripts which I adapted, or Dingo's Kidneys. No, what I mean? A vague idea. So we just talk rubbish. And actually, yeah, I still do, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Whilst I was at school doing that, I lived um, in a cul-de-sac which went on to a, a farm, um, an old farm, and the, it was a, a nice old farm. There was this doddery old farmer who used to go down this old me metal road to the farm right at the back of my house, and we would see him play in the fields in the corn and and the wheat and stuff, and muck about, and we would see the car coming along, and we'd go, duck! And we would duck in the corner like this, and we'd just be rippling around a bit, which was great fun. Um, and unfortunately, I don't know what really happened, but the farm got closed down, he moved away, and it stood there derelict for a long time. And we used to go and muck about there as kids, you know, be like climbing about through, and a look. We found a grenade once, <laughs> found a real grenade in, well, it's just at the back of the outside toilet block, and we, we had, my dad said, don't touch it, for God's sake, don't touch it, called the police, they called the bomb disposal unit, and they came and, and blew it up, which was, wow, you know, drama. And then one day, we were mucking about near the farm, and we saw this Ford Capri. Who had a Ford Capri? You look the wrong one. The right angle. <laughs> the Ford Capri came zooming up this metal road, it's a metal road, and suddenly these two blokes, got out in jeans and t-shirts, rolled onto the floor and were pointing what looked to us like guns at something in the farm. We couldn't really see and we thought, oh my god, gangsters. Anyway, they would struck this pose for a, a few minutes, well, minutes, seconds. Then they got up, got back in the car and reversed about a hundred yards and then did it again and drove up this thing, yanked, yanked over the doors, span out onto the floor, and, and we thought, we've we gone into a perverse universe or something, what's, what's happening there? Well, they were making a film, because we didn't know that. At the time, we sneaked up, had a look, and there was a camera, and it turned out that it was a, an outfit called Action Incorporated, a bunch of stuntmen who were making their own publicity film. And they'd taken over the farm, so they had this story of a kidnapping, where this girl was kidnapped, and these two blokes with the guns were the police. So they're chasing these kidnappers, three kidnappers and this poor girl, through and around this farm, up onto the roof. They were shooting at them, and they had all these stunts going on where they would roll off the roof, through a canopy, onto some mattresses and cardboard boxes, and all that. We thought it was great. Well, you do as a kid, don't you? You're like, oh, wow. And, what, and they went onto another roof and rolled down, and then they went into a barn, and they set fire to the barn. There was smoke pouring out of windows, there was flames licking the window frames and out the door. We went, oh my God. And the next second, this girl came leaping out, running. Ah! Flames all over her like this. She rushed past the camera, fell on the floor, and two burly blokes came and jumped on her with a big blanket and put out a fire. It was amazing. So 
they all cleared off, and the next day I borrowed my dad's SLR, didn't have a movie camera then, borrowed his SLR, and with my mates we did something called Mini Pete's First Job, and we made this slideshow, which was basically ripped off their script, and we copied what they did, bar the fire. They took all that, but they left the cardboard boxes and the mattresses, so we clambered up onto the roof and threw ourselves down. Whoa! Onto the roof. Thought it was great. I was bitten by the bug, as you can imagine. Well, I saw my careers officer at Forest Boys School in Horsham not long after that, and he said, Well, Richard, what would you like to do then when you leave school? It's not long. What would you like to... Oh, sir, um, can I be an actor or a film director, please? This was back in the 70s, you know, Horsham, little sort of insignificant little place, market town, sorry, didn't mean that, you know, but back in the 70s, you know, you didn't have those inroads, and they thought, he's a bit of an upstart, isn't he? Film director, an actor. He said, um, I've got a job uh, you could apply for as a printer. <laughs> so I said, oh, all right then, because you just weren't encouraged. So I went to be a printer for two years, um, and it was great fun. I quite enjoyed doing that. I learned how to publicise myself, if nothing else, down the line. It's funny how things, no matter what you do in life, you do learn something from it. You find them coming back. Do you find that? At some point you go, well, if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have known that. Well, I suppose that's pretty obvious. But I still wanted to uh, be an actor. I still wanted to be a film director or have something to do with the movies. And in the printing firm, came these two likely lads, and they were like, just like whatever happened to the likely lads. They had this sound studio, and they wanted to do video. And I was chatting to them, doing their printing, and I said, here, yeah, I've made some films. At that point, I started to do Super 8 films, nothing fancy. And I said to them, yeah, uh, any chance you could take somebody on? I said, well, we're going to set up this video studio. You could come and help that. We don't really know anything about video. I said, I know a lot about filmmaking. I know a lot about that. I, could, I would be really good for you and help you and tell you about long shots, wide shots, close-ups, all this sort of thing. Oh, yeah, he sounds all right. So I left the printing firm, went to join this company called Synoptics, who was operating out of Rosier Farm in Billingshurst. Um, if anybody knows Billingshurst, lovely place. Did a couple of videos there recently, by the way. Anyway, I uh, they had this. They, they were still thinking about this video business. But in the meantime, they hadn't quite got that, but they did have, this will surprise you, they had this business before the likes of Blockbusters, which is now gone, mm. videos, people could rent videos from these guys and other people like them, and they would drive up to your house, you would go outside in the cold and wet, and you'd open up the back door, and you could look at the selection of VHS videos that you could rent. And I was the monk driving round to all of these houses and going, how oh, about what would you like? We've got this. I don't remember all the films, but I remember it was the time the mirror cracked came out. So it was an Agatha Christie, if ever you remember that. So that was uh, one of the films. But a number of people kept saying, oh yeah, I've seen all those, Richard, but um, um, have you got any, um, got any specials? <laughs> 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 Uh, sorry, well, Mike, um, who used to come, always carried some specials. <laughs> so I don't really know what you mean. So when I got back, I said, there was this chap at number 53s, kept talking about specials. Ah, yeah, we should have told you. Um, they come in a, a white sleeve, and you keep them under the driver's seat, and if you see a policeman, <laughs> don't mention them. <laughs> I wasn't really sure what it meant, but of course, you know, after a while, a bit of a naive bloke, I started to... Uh, get an idea, and well, they were all numbered, no no saucy names on them, they were just all numbered, staff seen number three, I've, I've, I was after number five, I believe number five, because Barry's seen it, and it's very good, so I thought, oh well, that's out with uh, somebody else, <coughs> anyway, so I did that for a while, but um, I, I left home, and um, I was living in Petworth, it's all Sussex based this, isn't it, mm -hmm. notice, I was, uh, didn't go very far, Lived in Petworth, beautiful town, got involved with the youth theatre there. Nice people. Um, but I got a job teaching mime at uh, an all-girls school near Duncton called St Michael's. Yeah. It's now Flats. It's a beautiful old country house. 
Uh, but when I went there, these, these, it was a private school, and these girls were about 15, something like that, 13, 14, 15. And I was about 20, and uh, they were all kind of going, oh, we're mature girls, you know, we're very, you know, we're developed. Well, I wasn't having any of that, I was just teaching them this mind, which I had been interested in doing from my times at Lodge Hill, you see. So I got this job, it was quite good, because uh, I got quite a bit of money from that. So I set up, I, I didn't do that very long, um, I did that on a Monday, so they had the rest of the week free. So I set up something called the Toadstool Theatre Company. And we had this, um, there was a number of my mates who I knew from Lodge Hill, and we had this, um, what would you call it, physical theatre production. It was a bit of a weird thing, a sort of street theatre thing called the Beanbag Saga. Basically, we were living on beanbags, and we had this life on beanbags, and it was a sort of physical theatre thing. Anyway, it was a bit silly. But I got, got our first gig, our first and only gig, I should say, um, in Scotland, in Stirling. <laughs> there were four of us in the group, and I said, we've got this gig, they're paying us lots of money, it's in Stirling. And these other four said, well, we're not going. I said, what do you mean we're not going? I've got the booking and everything, they're expecting us, we're on the billboards, Toadstool Theatre Company, we've got to go. They said, no, we don't, I don't want to do it. So I said, well, we can't let them down. So I went and did it on my own as a one-man show. You know, you, once you've sold the tickets, it's like today. I have to come and do it. Anyway, so um, I was doing that, and I was doing a lot of mime and stuff, and teaching mime, and in the end, in the end, I thought, I'd better do this mime thing a bit serious-like. Um, so I went to the Desmond Jones School of Mime, which is in Shepherd's Bush, not in Sussex. Uh, that's in London, for those of you who don't know. Um, and it's a funny old church hall, not too dissimilar to this, actually, now I remember it. And so I used to do a bit of mime. Now, when you... So I learnt mime, it's been a year there. And when you say mime to people, it's a bit like when you say you do... You're a stand-up comic. People always say, oh, go on, tell us a joke then. Go on, tell us a joke. They always say, go on, do us a bit of mime. You don't say that to an undertaker, do you? Go on, do us a bit of burying. Go on, do us a bit of plumbing to the plumbing. They don't say that. But when you're at anything performing, they expect you to just snap and do it. So, um, the thing about mime is, of course, you need to have a little bit of mime putty, otherwise you can't do anything. So, um, without further ado, if I get this right... Mime putty. It's amazing what you can do with a bit of nothing. 
out of condition, too many walks. It's an extra job. <laughs> so, I got on the corporate sector, doing the mime, earning a living. And one of the things I used to earn loads of money, enough to support a family and all of that was with a suitcase. Not a commuter, but an ordinary, everyday, slightly magical suitcase. <laughs> Thing there. At the same time, I was doing, in order to pay the bills, I was doing extra work and walk on parts. Um, I was in the bill. They had regular PCs in the bill, um, background PCs here, the main cast, and then you had all these background artists who were sort of pretending to be at Sun Hill as regular PCs. You recognise me because I was white shirt behind frosted glass window in the corridor. <laughs> that was me. You probably saw me loads of time. There he is, look, flash and he's gone. I was in Waiting for God, Poirot as a policeman, Victorian policeman, London's Burning, Campion, many, many other of that sort of late 80s era. And then, something important happened to me whilst I was doing all of that. Got married. Got married. Um, and Dawn is here at the back who I got married to, but uh, I got divorced later on. <laughs> but we're still friends, aren't we? Yes. And we had three delightful children, one of which is um, about to have a baby himself. Well, his good lady's about to have a baby. He's just taking the credit for it. Um, he can't be here. But my other two children, lovely Georgie on the camera, give her a big wave. And uh, Billy, who's sitting over there. So I bought a house in Worthing and um, started to do more of the old corporate stuff, guard streets and that sort of thing. But I'm still determined 
to make something in my life instead of just sort of doing this low-level stuff. I went desperate to do something. And I came up with this idea for a children's television programme. It was called Snug and Cozy. And it went out. We made a pilot. And fortunately, it was amazing, fortunately, ITV went for it. And we had two series in 1996 and 1997. This 10-minute slapstick programme called Snug and Cozy. And I'm now going to play the theme tune, because you're probably all children at the time, back then, you probably all remember it, but fondly. spoke a squidge. Oh, cozy. You should sit on a little fringe, lover. Not with you, nimpy, plump flapper. You go and flap on a stew slosler. A stew slosler? Yes, another stew slosler. I don't want to get another blue schnozzler. Well, get another fringe, lover. We're sort of Laurel and Hardy in spacesuits. <laughs> anyway, we did that for two seasons. You needed a third season to really make it. <laughs> First season, people go, what the hell? <laughs> Second season is, didn't we see that idiot before? Third season is when they go, oh yeah, I remember, it's really good, and you get established. Unfortunately, story of my life, unfortunately, there was a change at the top. For political reasons, all of the programmes that were being made by Scottish television, who we were then being made in this series, which we shot all up in Scotland, near Stirling, but not in Stirling, in Glasgow, actually. <laughs> down Socky Hole Street, um, and all these programmes got axed, and we were one of them. So we never got the all-important third series that would have made us a household name like the Chapel Brothers. So uh, maybe that's uh, a good thing, who knows? So Snug and Cozy had a demise. I went back to the corporate circuit entertaining, doing all that sort of nonsense. And that was quite fun for a while. I pitched other ideas to television, uh, wasn't getting nowhere. I like taking my trousers off. I'm very good at that. And um, so then I got into podcasting. Back in 2004, at the end of 2004, podcasting was just reaching Britain. And myself and three others uh, were the first British podcasters, January 2005. Started to do this show. Does everybody know what podcasting? I'm not talking nonsense. No. Back then, no one had heard of it. But we did this sort of radio show from Beach Hut in Worthing in West Sussex at the foot of the South Downs at the edge of the English Channel. Well, it wasn't actually a real Beach Hut, but that was the persona. And uh, I get a chance to have a bit of a break now because. Number seven, thank you. Do you know, I think it's Monday, the 22nd of March 2010. You're listening to Richard Vobes. Ah, oh, there we are. The old beach hut seems to be quite OK. Take a listen to that. Whoa, careful. Whoa. Oops. <laughs> Can't see very well with one eye at the moment. Well, there we go. Ah, oh, there's the old microphone and the desk. And oh, careful not to tread on. Sorry, squeaker. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Vogue Show. Uh, this is the Vogue here behind the microphone. I'm waving. Can you see me? No, look harder. I'm behind the microphone. No, no, that's a box. No, don't look in there. No, please, don't open that. Oh, no! 
You've let him out now. That's Eric. Hello, sir. Yes, it's nice to be let out of the box again, sir. Thank you so much. Is there anything you want me to do, sir? I can do all sorts of stuff for you. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, maybe a cup of tea. That would be quite nice. Anyway, that was, uh, that was the Vogue show, which was a 30-minute daily show that I did um, for nearly 10 years, I think. Um, it was quite fun. We did started to do cam shows, so, um, like we do on the Facebook page now. We do these live shows, but it was, a, it was in the early days when you could get about eight or nine viewers, and that maxed out the bandwidth. You couldn't really do much more than that. So we were doing these cam shows. But it was amazing who was watching. And then one day, Danny Baker, you know who Danny Baker is, he called in to our show, and we had a chat. We were sort of slightly gobsmacked by this. This was amazing. Uh, had a little chat and he said some very nice things and we kept doing these shows and then all of a sudden we had another mystery caller hello who's calling hello richard it's jonathan ross calling how are you jonathan ross the jonathan ross the one and the only although there are probably some others but i'm the one you're probably thinking of <laughs> good good god <laughs> we were just we were just debating we were just saying because Danny Baker just left this message and we were just saying, you know, it's so easy for anybody can type in those things. And we do get a load of fake things in the message system that we get through to the studio. And you're trying to sort of work out who's real and who's saying sensible stuff, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so we started saying it. It's, it's brilliant. Hello. Well, that's quite a deep and existential point you might be making there. <laughs> who amongst us is real and who is just a fake? Well, absolutely. Um, well, we know you're not a fake. Because we've seen you around. Well, you never know. What if my whole life and career has been a fakery so far? What if I'm nothing but a huge monument to deception? Well, you see, Richard, think on that. Well, the only way to actually prove that, um, Jonathan, would be to get down into the existentialist beach hut here on Worthing Seafront and um, join Nigel, Jimmy and I and do a show. Oh. <laughs> If only, if only, I, if only I had the willpower. If only I had the the, 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 the self control to come down there and to, to hunker down with you, with you. Yes, I know. It's 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 hard to resist. Danny, Danny has uh, bless him has de declined, and uh, but I know it's very hard for people. Oh uh, well, Danny's off at the Ivy. Oh, is he? Well, that's all very. Oh yeah, God, yes, he's always at the Ivy, swanning around. Oh right. Oh, I see. He said to me yesterday, or Friday, he said, I never go out. Oh, he said, how do you think he got to that size if he's never out? <laughs> That's a good point. Bless him. Uh, <laughs> so tell me, you've got to ask this, answer this question. What is the, what is the Jonathan Ross that we... Uh, say hello to Nigel, by the way. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Nigel. How are you doing? I'm very well, thanks. You? Good. I'm, I'm in fine health. What brings, what brings a man like you to a show like ours? Look, there are very few out there who are walking to the march of their own individual drum, Richard. Okay? And, and when we encounter them, they must be supported and encouraged. And you are one of them, and I'm offering you my support and encouragement. Oh, well, that's very kind of you. I mean, it's just a thrill. It's a thrill. It's so... Um, I mean, the, the, since Danny rang in the other day, I just was on a complete high thinking this is a bit strange. But then... The pressure is now on. You think, we've got to raise the game, we've got to raise the game. These, But, you know, you kind of think, well, we need, need to be on, on, on our top performance, which tonight was a complete disaster. Well, but well, then maybe that's what people love about you, Richard. Yeah, uh, I hope so. <laughs> I surely well hope so. I'm sure, I'm sure that I suspect I will just be the first of many. Richard, I would love to talk longer, but my, my gorgeous and sexy, vibrant wife has just entered the room, and although she looks like she's only here for business, as always, I'm going to try and turn it into pleasure. Of course, and I don't blame you one iota, matey. Go for it. It's lovely to talk to you, and thank you so much for coming. My pleasure. You'll hear from me again, Richard. Oh, you're a star. <laughs> well, you know that. You know that, of course. What a silly <laughs> thing to say. Have fun. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That was in 2008, ladies and gentlemen when he rang and he said at the end there, you'll hear from me again. Well, I'm still waiting. waiting. <laughs> <laughs> so we thought, oh, you know, someone's going to give us a leg up. You couldn't get better than Jonathan Ross, like him or loathe him, you know. He was somebody who was with the movers and shakers uh, and uh, wasn't to be. But uh, anyway, so carried on doing that. Got to a point where the uh, podcast was not sort of really going very far and I'm itching to get back onto the screen and do stuff. And... 
after pacing up and down with my new girlfriend, then Harriet, who can't be here because she's down in Dorset at a confirmation for her godchildren, but uh, she sends her regards, by the way, and you may have seen her in some of the videos. Um, I got, after chatting to her a long time about what I should do, the Bald Explorer was born. And in 2013, we made our first full-length documentary about Lewis, and it's on YouTube, um, and then we made another seven about different other things, Petworth and um, a canal one and travelling and goodness knows what. And, but they took forever to make and I was confused on how to build an audience and then eventually uh, the time came right to do the walks and that's what I'm doing at the moment. So anyway, so that's my life story as dull and boring as it is. Um, you've got a little bit of uh, background now to me. But of course you don't want to know anything about me. I'm the boring one. Here, we want to know about the one and only, the incredible and the very sexy, it has to be said, <laughs> Martin Snow. So we're going to bring Martin back on again and we're going to find out all about Martin Snow. Martin Snow. And uh, what is your specialised subject? The life and times of Martin Snow. <laughs> so Martin Snow, you have two minutes on the life and times of Martin Snow, Snow starting <laughs> now. What Victorian institution were you born in? The Brighton Workhouse. Correct. Where did you move to from Brighton after the old toll bridge was replaced by the Shoreham flyover and in what year? In 1970 and moved to Worthing. Correct. What put an end to your full-time study in 1971? I had a motorcycle accident when a drunk pulled across in front of me. And what happened to your knee? And uh, I've got a dodgy knee ever since. Correct. What, <laughs> what profession did you discover that you had a talent for? Oh, being an astronaut. Uh, no, that's incorrect. Oh. Uh, you actually discovered you have a talent for accountancy, and you became an accountant in 1975. No points for that one. What other important event occurred in 1975? I got married. Snap. <laughs> Although I didn't do it in 1975. Correct. In 1979, you changed your career. Why was this, and what to? Um, I bought... I bought a computer and taught myself to program it. And, and after uh, that, you, something happened to you? Oh, and I was headhunted uh, for a software company. Correct. What is G6MBL? That is my radio amateur call sign. So you're a, a hand, are you? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, what, correct. What are the names of your two children? Uh, oh, I'll have to pass. <laughs> you pass on that one. What was the leap of faith that you took in 1985? Uh, I started my own computer business. Correct. What action did you do in 1989 that inspired, or possibly inspired, the spy novelist John Le Carre? Um I was one of the last people to come over the Berlin Wall. I was... Uh, Travelling back from Tbilisi in Georgia after installing my software, and I had four days um, by rail through Moscow and Poland. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> you were refused, all true by the way, you were refused a role in the life of Brian. However, you were offered another religious calling in India. In what capacity and when was it? Um, <laughs> uh, in, in 1990. I was uh, summoned to become a sound engineer 
on a film that's being made about an order of nuns to publicise them. Were the nuns on the run? Not that time. No, just your sister act. Yes. Throughout your life, you had a consuming interest in something. Could you tell us what it is? Um, consuming passion. I think or I something. I think I had to pass on this one. So you passed on that one. What is your current role? Um, I'm general secretary, general secretary of the Sussex Industrial Archaeology Society. Uh, what do you do there? I'm secretary. You, I mean, <laughs> you run a news editor. Uh, you know, uh, I, sorry, yes, I, I'm, I'm, the, I, I'm also the newsletter editor and general dog's body. Correct. Could you give me the exact number of publications that you have, that's in <coughs> magazines, books, and any digital format on your computer, uh, and any other things that you have related to literature on your shelves at home? The exact number, please. Right, 4,376. Uh, 4,377. You've had an Amazon delivery since the show started. Oh. <laughs> Finally, finally, uh, what is your fetish with orange? <laughs> mm. Pass. Well, you've passed on three questions. Uh, the names of your children are Al Alcyon and Talitha. Oh, yes. That's right. Your passion is heritage, and your fetish with orange is beyond the power of even the Lord. <laughs> you scored 10 points, uh, Martin Snow. Thank you very much. Please see a big round of gentlemen, it's nearly time to have some liquid refreshment, but before we get there, would anyone first like a quick glass of water? Somebody. Martin, could you bring on our water, which is just over there, thank you very much, sir. There's a gentleman here who's got his arms folded, and he'd love to have a glass of water. Now, actually, uh, before you have this water, let me tell you, it is fresh, it's clean, it's pure, it's straight from the aquifer below this very building itself. Um, actually, I have to ask you this other question, uh, how do you know it's safe? Because I trust you, Richard. You trust me, that's uh, probably the wrong answer. I'll take it away because yeah. it, it may not be safe. Because no. You probably uh, don't remember the terrible events of 1893 in Worthing. I mean, some of you look old enough, but it was thereafter known as Fever Year, a black spot in Worthing's history when uh, I think something like 1,500 cases of typhus and other related diseases broke out uh, from badly polluted water. There were 165 deaths from this. Um, so let me take you back in time, ladies and gentlemen, uh, well before the likes of southern water had a stranglehold on our elixir of life, about 125 years, a, a small drip on the leaky pipe of time. All through the 19th century, uh, water and its drainage was the preoccupation of the Worthing authorities. You see, back then, water came from the town wells. And there was, uh, in the 1840s, there were, these wells were becoming polluted by cesspools. And there were complaints about the noisome smells coming from the drains. So a board of health was set up to deal with the problem. After all, Worthing was fast becoming a fashionable seaside town. It wouldn't do to serve up the wrong coloured water. It wasn't Tunbridge Wells, after all. So, <clears throat> what they did is they decided they would put in a new well. They sunk the well just off Lindhurst Road, which is just round the corner from here. They connected it to a pumping station and a big water tower. They connected the pipes up and ran them into the town. Worthing was on the mains. Yippee! The second thing they did was to install a new drainage system. They put the sewer head close to the waterworks so that they could pump out the unwanted effluent 
into the sea, just as the British public were being told to go down to the salty sea water for health and recreation. Very sensible. But you see, Worthing was a very successful town, and people were coming. The trains was bringing in day trippers and boarders and visitors and would-be boarders, and people wanted to move here, and the waterworks was pumping out this water, and people were using it and drinking it up, and it was all very nice, and the water's coming out the drain, and people would use that, the water's coming out the drain, and it's 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 coming out the drain, and they knew that there was another reservoir of water close to the uh, big reservoir and the, the, the well. So all they had to do was sink another well, connect it up with a bit of tunnelling, and Bob's your uncle, you'd have plenty of water for Worthing, Shoreham and Hove, actually, if they came begging. So, it was a great idea. What could go wrong? The next well was sunk in 1885. 175 feet below ground, that's a lot of um, shovelfuls, I think you'll agree. Then the tunnelling along horizontally until they got up to the water. You can almost picture it now, can't you, ladies and gentlemen? There they are, tunnelling along like this, and they managed to get up to the thing. Oh, I think I can hear the water. Yes, it's definitely the water. All we need to do is smash through. Martin, thank you very much. Is that balanced? It's got to be balanced. Hang on, just double check that. Um, Oh yeah, that's all right, that's balanced. So when they, they smashed their way through like that, the water came gushing in, thank you Martin, and it came zooming through much quicker than they'd anticipated. So they dropped their tools and they fled right up the tunnel, just in the nick of time, escaping with their lives. But they had the water. Then, then came the analysis. Where is that water? Oh, that's right over there. Look at that. Hey. It's a funny colour. What? No, there's nothing wrong with that water. Look at it. That's fresh, clean and pure. The slight discoloration in it is probably down to iron oxide. Uh, oh, so it's a calibrate then, is it? That's a Tunbridge Wells joke there. Mm. Have, has any of you tried the uh, spring water from Tunbridge Wells? Yes. The uh, slight discoloration that they have there? It's due to the iron oxide. Tastes like blood. Have you ever tried it? I've tried it, did it in one of my bald explorers actually. It tastes a bit like blood, it's quite horrible. Anyway, the authorities weren't too worried. N not about the Tunbridge Wells water, not about the wording, discoloration. They, they, go, they were under pressure to get this new water, this fresh supply up. So they connected it up to the pipes, bunged it down into the town, and everybody could have it, and they crossed their fingers. Mm. Well, it wouldn't have mattered if they'd mashed their toes together or twisted their hips 180 degrees, because within days, the first cases of enteric fever were reported. People were getting ill. The doctor's surgeries were filling up. It wasn't long before the fingers started to be pointing at the waterworks. Well, the authorities simply shrugged their shoulders and blamed the workers. It was the night shift that did it. They polluted the water, they claimed. Now, I'm not quite sure what they meant by that. Possibly that when the brickies were laying out the tunnel, you know, it's a long way down, 75 feet below the ground, and it's a long way back up to go to the, well, you know, the little boys' room. So maybe, a bit dark, no one could see, perhaps, you know, they did pollute the water in some fashion. Anyway, the authorities said, don't panic. It'll pass, it'll clear, it'll be fine. All you've got to do, a bit of advice, boil the water first. So that was good advice, and people did boil the water, and it was fine, and everything was okay. And this little epidemic soon went away, and everyone was happy with it. In fact, the chief medical officer, Charles, Dr. Charles May, said, he went so bold to say, I think we can now say that the epidemic is at an end. Was that enough to quell the worries of the seaside visitors, the residents and people intending to come? Maybe it was the letters to the newspapers, the editors of prominent London newspapers, signed by the, uh, the chairman of the Sanitary Commission, the, uh, the, the mayor and the town clerk, that limited the damage to the town's um, reputation. Maybe that was what it was. But anyway, whatever it was, people, they put their faith back into the authorities and they started to drink the water. The one thing they didn't do, they didn't boil it anymore. The nincompoops, the idiots, the fools! 
They put their lives back into the already proven bungling authorities. As soon as they took that first sip of unboiled water, the evil molecules within it started to do its nasty work. Headaches, ooh. Abdominal pains, oh, nasty. Internal bleeding, fever, squitty bottoms. Well, actually, it was the kids that had the squitty bottoms and brown runny stuff. The, the grown-ups tended to have a terrible uh, constipation. It was, uh, it was dreadful. Uh, as I say, 1,500 cases of typhus and that sort of thing was uh, breaking out all over the place. It was July now, the height of the season. There were 65 deaths, and panic ensued. Well, it's actually quite tricky to panic when your bowels refuse to open, your head is splitting at the seams, and sweat is being produced from your glands like a feverish hot pan of boiling milk. So the, uh, the, the Sanitary Commission desperately needed some fresh water, and like yesterday, or even like last month, and they decided the best thing to do was to tap the lovely fresh spring water from the Chalky South Downs to the north of the town. And that's what they did. And they were started to put tanks into the um, streets, not like German tanks or anything like that, no, water tanks, which could take up to about 200 gallons of water. And it was great because people could come out with their kettles and their, their pails and their buckets and not spades, but all sorts of little water containers. And it was great and it was fantastic, but it was a bit late because people were dying. And there were other people doubled up wishing they were dead. The hospitals couldn't cope. The infirmary only had 15 beds for heaven's sake. They put tents onto the lawn, two tents containing eight beds each. <coughs> But that wasn't enough. Other places needed to be um, commandeered. So they used missionary halls, hotels, chapels, schools, all sorts of things. Even people were being treated in their own home. And then the rumours started. Here, here, Harold, have a look at this. Oh, what is it, Maud? Out there, look, in the dark, there's, there's men. What do you mean, men? Running about. Oh, look at them. Oh, they've got long, narrow boxes. Oh, my God. They're coffins. That's right. Midnight burials at Broadwater Church. Well, I don't know if that was really what was going on, but that's what people thought. But why? Why? Why were people dying? Why were they infected? What had gone wrong? All the money that was spent on everything. It was madness. Well... It wouldn't take a village idiot to realise what had been happening. The wells that they had produced to get the water was too close to the other sluices to get rid of the effluent. And there was some cross-channel confusion, and it began to pollute the water. One expert said, this is bonkers. You should have had 200 yards between them and watertight tunnels. It's absolutely madness. Well, you can imagine, this did nothing for the town's reputation, and uh, the papers were scathing. Hundreds of innocent lives have been sacrificed, and thousands of lodging house keepers and tradesmen brought to the verge of ruin by the iniquitous manner in which folly has been combined with negligence. To have old and abominably constructed sewers in close proximity to the well supplying the town with water seems simply the act of madmen, and Worthing's municipal notabilities can be little else. Not long since, Worthing was promoted to borough rank. It should have been condemned to a silent ship. Well, you can imagine, people didn't want to come to Worthing anymore. It was a, a bit of a ghost town. The Sussex Daily News put it like this. A walk through the town was sad in the extreme. The townspeople keep their hearts up as well they can, but a deep depression seems to pervade the very atmosphere. Only two vehicles were seen in motion on the streets yesterday, and one of them was a hearse. The seafront was deserted by all save a few watermen, who had nothing to do and did not seem to expect any customers. The wide stretch of the pier lay shining in the sea, but not a living soul moved there. Not a cab 
was to be seen on the seafront, and everyone in Worthing last spring was looking forward to a summer of exceptional prosperity. It took two seasons before Worthing recovered from that terrible thing, but it did recover. A lot of businesses went down the plug hole, that nice, clean, sanitised plug holes by now, by the way, and the water was clear and lovely. But they did come back, and Worthing sort of braced itself and got up, pulled its plug out, pulled its finger out, and it all was, was fine. And then, another tragedy for Worthing, just when it was safe to go back in the water, so to speak, in 1933, the pier caught fire. Mm. But that, my friends, is another story. So, ladies and gentlemen, a bit of history there for you, a bit of history about Worthing. And I expect that's made you extra thirsty now, and you can't <laughs> wait to get to the bar. So, um, it is now going to be bar time. We're going to bring in the wonderful, travelling, terrifying, ter tipsy termites, who are going to play a little bit in the interim whilst you go around. But before you go to the bar, I've got a little duty for you to perform. Over on the desk there are some bits of paper and some pens. I want two things from you. One thing, your favourite place in Sussex. If you could write that down on a bit of paper. Hold on to the paper. And the other thing is we're going to do a Q&A a little bit later in the second act, second half. And so if you've got a question that you would like to ask, you can also write that down. There's probably not enough pens to go round, so try and you can take some of the pens but bring them back. You can do it in the bar or on the way back or at some point. Okay? So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I hope that you'll stay and see the second half because we've got some more thrills and spills for you. So until then, from me and lovely Martin Snow, give him a big round of applause. We'll see you later.